moment we're on Zoom. Because <laughs> the introduction works like a Zoom. I'm Peter Schneider, I'm one of the producers of this show, and I'm with a popcorn with Sarah. I'm Sarah Gruen, and I've done two Zoom calls in my life, so I think I'm wow. popping the corn. <laughs> I'm, I'm Rick Ellis, and uh, I'm going to pop <laughs> Are you going to Are we identifying ourselves too? You could. I'm, I, I've taken Sarah Gruen's wonderful novel and done terrible things to it. <laughs> uh, and uh, 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 ably, ably, um, uh, uh, in, in concert with uh, these gentlemen uh, over here, um, who are four sevenths of the Pink Pen Theater Collective, um, beginning with Matt. Go ahead, Matt. Hi, my name is Matt Berenberger. I'm one of the songwriters. Popcorn. Popcorn. <laughs> this is not popcorn if we go on a line. I'm going to popcorn the dam. <laughs> I'm Jen Weschler. I'm one of the seven songwriters. I'm Ryan Mealy. I'm one of the seven songwriters. I am Ben Ferguson, and I am also one of the songwriters. Thank you very much. On behalf, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And collectively, our company is called Pig Pen Theater Company. <laughs> And there are three members missing. Yeah, yeah. it's good to know where they are. We were standing there a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of the producers, and two other producers are joining me tonight, Beth Williams and Mindy Rich. So thank you very much. And I feel as though you're all here under false pretenses. I look at this particular flyer. It says, books that changed my life. And we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> We're going to talk about journeys that changed our lives, because this is a journey. We've all been on a journey for me, it's 10 years, to bring this one of Albans to life. And 10 years ago, I had the honor and privilege of meeting Sarah Grew, and I read the book. I fell in love with the book, as most of you all have read the book and have the same emotion to it, and was impressed enough to think, it might make a musical. And so I called up Sarah's agent and I said, can I have coffee with Sarah? And I went and I sat down with Sarah and tried to convince her to let her book become a musical. But I don't want to go backwards and say, Sarah, why did you write this damn book in the first place? <laughs> um, I actually don't know at the beginning. I was writing another book that I consider my springboard book because I keep going back to it and one day maybe I'll finish it. I don't think it's a bad idea. But I, was, I opened the Sunday paper one day and there was a huge vintage circus photograph and the detail on it was just incredible. The guy who took the pictures made his own camera and so the negatives were enormous and he could take pictures of 1500, the whole, you know, the whole of the Ringling Circus or a whole of a, a you could see the wrinkles in the stockings and the feathered fronds and everything. The details were just amazing. And I, I was looking at this photograph. I hadn't read anything yet, but it was called Congress of Freaks. And I just, the details in it, how's this is getting more and more nervous. I could hear him pacing. And finally I said, this, this is what I'm going to do. And we had just taken a research trip for the other, you know, other book. But unfortunately, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nobody ever asked me questions about might finish it someday. But it was basically the vintage service photograph, and then the second I dove into it, um, I, I started reading the stories about the elephants, and those were those were what really just started. I just love that one, of course. And how do you go with themes? Because clearly we're here to talk about themes, emotional themes, because the book is extremely emotional, besides the circus and elephants. Where do you find your themes? How do you look in terms of your writing, in terms of themes and thematic emotions? I don't look for it. I think I find the same themes um, in all my books. I think it doesn't really matter what the background is. I am really just, I, I try to uh, explore the way people are to each other, when they're awful to each other, when they're great, when they're, you know, the, the relationships, the, the chosen families, um, what people do to each other, what people do to animals, what animals do to people, and how they feel about each other. And, the more I learned about the circus, the more the, this in this particular time setting, um, the more dire and sort of a very um, it wasn't a very safe place for these people to be working and living. And so it, it came from much of that came from their instability. And now it's been adapted to a movie. The process of adaptation. 
How do you feel about people adapting your work, taking your work, your baby, and doing something with it? It's a show, Peter. It's not a movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's I'm a movie sorry. Guy. What movie? <laughs> Honestly, I, I'm thrilled. If, if someone does a good job, I could not be happier. I'm just, what an adventure, what, a, what an honor, and, a, and just a complete surprise in my life. So after I met Sarah, I had known Rick Ellis, the person on Sarah's right, uh, for almost 30 years now. And as we all know, Rick has tremendous credits, which we're not going to talk about. And, uh, <laughs> We are going to talk about the 86 Mets, though. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to talk about his credit. We all know he's very famous. And I turned to Rick and I had lunch at uh, Chez Martin. Where did we have lunch? Breakfast at? Nice Martin. Nice Martin. Thank you very much. And I said, Rick, would you be interested in adapting this book? So, Rick, why did you do it? Anything for a free lunch. <laughs> Uh, we're in the theater. Free lunch and free lunch. Um, uh, why did I do it? Well, I, you know, I, I was in a, a book club in the aughts when the novel came out, and so I, I, I was familiar with the novel. Uh, I was not familiar with that motion picture to which you alluded. Um, it escaped me. I, I'm not sure why, but um, uh, I had done... Uh, I like working in the theater because it's a collaborative form. Um, I, I can't imagine what, how to write a novel because you'd be writing, working by yourself all the time. And if I were left to my own devices, I would never sit down at my desk. You know. <laughs> so um, I like the collaborative form, and I liked the experience of adap adapting a novel with a play that I had worked on called Peter and the Starcatcher which was a, a, a 500 page novel written by two great writers and I was fans of their writing and it was really, really interesting to try to figure out how to, how to do it. But that was a novel written um, for a young uh, reader. And uh, obviously Water for Elephants is a, a, a novel written for an, <laughs> uh, an adult reader. And, um, and I, but I like the, I, I like the idea of adapting. Um, because it's a whole different process, right? You can't um, present on stage in one night starting at 8 o'clock and then having you back in your cars or back on the subway or the bus by 10.35 and do a whole novel. You can say, well, we're going to do a whole novel, and you could end up with something like Nicholas Nickleby, which takes nine hours. <laughs> and, but nowadays, I don't even know that that could happen now, because... Nobody wants to sit for nine hours anymore. It's hard enough to get people to sit for nine minutes. So when you have a great novel full of story, full of characters that are compelling, how do you figure out how to do it in um, two hours traffic of the stage? What do you leave out? What do you include? What do you conflate? Um, and that to me is really, really interesting, especially with a story as rich and layered um, and challenging for the stage as What If Relevance. Because in a movie, of course, you know, you hire an elephant and a guy who's an elephant wrangler, and you probably have three elephants, so you like the eyes on that one, you like the tail on that one, and you, can, you know, can balance on the ball. So, you know, that's, so you, so that's how you do it. That's how you do it. But on stage, you're, you're not going to have a real elephant, or if you do, you're sort of a schmuck, because, you know, it's not the movies. It's the theater. And the theater, you have this great contract with each other, which is, here are the rules that we're going to play by, play along. And that sort of interactivity of imagination is, um, is thrilling to me, and it's always been thrilling to me as a lifelong theater fan. And I, um, I was really intrigued by the challenge of doing it and not um, uh, screwing it up, which you know uh, we will leave in your capable hands. But um, uh, if you if you should be fortunate enough to come to see it, and uh, 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 I had also um, spent some months the year before uh, with uh, Pigpen uh, because um, I had been asked to adapt a, another novel uh, with some less scrupulous producers who turned out not to have the rights for the thing that they asked us to do. So we spent some we spent some time trying to crack a nut. And, um, and I really enjoyed 
the time that we spent together. So when Peter said, is this something you'd be interested in? I said, uh, being familiar with the novel, I said, yes, if I can do it with these guys. Um, it's not traditional to have seven songwriters. It's, you know, sometimes you have no songwriters. Sometimes it's a pre-existing score. Sometimes you have a composer slash lyricist. It's one person who wants all the money. And sometimes, and sometimes. <laughs> Unlike you. <laughs> Believe me, being a book writer is not a scheme, it's not a scheme, a money-making scheme, trust me. But um, uh, uh, I, I, I thought it would be really interesting to try for the eight of us to figure out how to tell this story, how to figure out what an organizing principle would be in order to tell it, and, um, and what to, through that organizing principle, what we would be smart enough to include, exclude, how we would pitch this to Sarah and, and get her um, blessing to do it, and to, uh, and to keep um, Peter and Mindy and Beth and the other producers interested in proceeding because it's been a long time. I mean, that conversation with Peter was nine years ago. That needs to attend lunch. They were still serving lunch in those days. And um, and, and and then uh, uh, and Peter said, "Okay, get in touch with them." And and, um, and here they are. And uh, and you'll understand why. They, they you know it's not it's not going to sound like any show that you've seen, and it's not going to look like any show that you've seen. And, you know, I gotta tell you, I've been going to the theater all my life, and I think, man, if I were a kid going to see this, I would spend the rest of my life wanting to be in the theater. Be um, before you go there and talk about music, can you talk about the intimidation of adapting a book? And did you, you talk about how it is that you got her a blessing or not got a blessing or the process of, in terms of her interaction? I'm just a sweetie pie. Yes. <laughs> Sarah, like Ado Annie, he can't say no. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it, it, here, I mean, for me personally, if I were if I were twenty five, being asked to do this, I would I would have had a different response to the novel, and, and I would have a I would have had a different conversation to begin with with you guys. But I'm not twenty five years old, um, so the. Early on, the conversation that I had with Sarah specifically about um, the adaptation was that the, um, there's a, the the story is told through the eyes of an elderly gentleman, quite old, in his 90s, and he remembers a particular period of time during the Depression uh, when he specifically worked at this particular circus and these particular people and animals were there. And, um, and I was interested in the, uh, in seeing if we could make a, if we could sort of do a twist on a coming of age story and make this a coming of age story, not about a young person, the way we generally think of coming of age stories. Oh, it's a kid and he or she is gonna become an adult by the end of the story and be a better person for it, by golly. And, and they will come of age. And I wondered, as I was moving into my twilight years when Peter first came to me, um, I thought, what what would be like if we age, if we if we age down the, the the older character so that um, he uh, he was still sort of um, a, a vital and a viable person so that at the at the end of our journey that this character would sort of come of age he would you know how they say there are no second acts in American life how somebody who had lived a life and who just figured that he was a bump on a log, you know, just waiting for the other shoe to drop, um, nothing to look forward to, suddenly had something to look forward to, and to, um, and to, be, uh, and to not expect it. Um, and I thought it would be, it would be cool to, uh, if we could do that, because um, that was sort of where I was in my life at that moment, and still am, you know, trying to figure out how do you move into this section of your life when, you know, you're not the, you know, you're not like in the target of what everybody's sort of pitching, and you don't look the way people or look who are, you know, younger, and you're not doing, you know, those things, and your knees are hurting, and you're, you know, what's, but you're still a person, you know, and you still think and feel, and you care, and can love, and can hate, and can fight, and can get upset about the things that you win, and the things that you lose, and, and, uh, so that was sort of my pitch that, and within that, we would be able to conflate and eliminate certain aspects of the novel so that we could concentrate more on what this 
on, on the, the journey that the, old, the older man is taking, not just the journey that the younger man is taking. And how did you respond to that? I was very happy because I think that, I was afraid that maybe people would want to remove the old man. So Can you talk was, about that a bit? Because um, I think it was, well, I don't, I don't think it was you, so I just, it's, um, but I think the movie, I don't know, people were very fast to want to jettison the nursing home scenes and the old man scenes, and I just couldn't, I couldn't. <laughs> because he is, he's, the old one is the soul of the book. I don't know that he's coming to age again. <laughs> Yeah, so we didn't get Denison, although it's very cleverly done, to yes. have Rick entwined that sort of nursing home scene into it, and it's not linear, so that's part of the It's really fun. brilliant. I'm just afraid of spoilers. Okay. <laughs> They're not coming to see the show anyway. <laughs> and as they say, it's a musical. It's not a topical. It's not a danceical. It's a musical. <laughs> Talk. That would be called a play, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you want to talk a little bit about how you then work with these extraordinary gentlemen in terms of the adaptation of lyrics, words, into music and style? Who's going to break that up? These, I mean, I, I, are you familiar with these guys? Have you, are you familiar with them? I mean, they're, they're, they're. Uh, I had seen a, a piece that they had created called The Old Man and the Old Moon that was performed uh, in a church basement, I think, down in Washington Square. Um, and I immediately thought, oh, I'd like these are totally the guys that I would be, I would have been begging to be part of this group if I, you know, wasn't old enough to be their grandfather. So, <laughs> you know, so I, I thought, oh, I, you know, I gotta meet these guys. We, we, we spent a lot of time on the first thing, the aborted thing. Um, sort of sniffing around each other and getting to know each other. But the thing that's interesting, <laughs> the thing, that's a zoo story, you know. Um, um, the, the interesting thing that I think we started on was we, we, we were, you do this thing called song spotting, you know, where you sort of outline the events of the story. You think, oh, well, a song would be good here, a number would be good here differentiating them like a song that a character might sing to another character versus something that would involve a lot of people. Uh, that's what we, you know, a number, but everything is a number to the theater because, you know, that's how you can move back and forth in the script. So, um, uh, but, you know, what might this sound like? The bulk of the story takes place in 1931. It's a very specific time, specific state for the country. It's, it's the Depression, but the Depression is, has been happening. It's Prohibition, but Prohibition has been happening. Um, these things are not new. These, the, America was sort of in the same kind of way. You know, this was uh, at the time. Don't the, go there. At the time that we were talking about doing this, we, you know, here we were. We were sort of in like a like what the hell's going to happen now kind of place for America, which was very much like 1931. And so what we talked about always was here are particular types of music from that period, um, Cat Calloway or. Um, bluegrass or um, uh, Ema Sumac in those Duke Ellington where you hear like a female voice and just percussion, which is something you've, ne you've never heard in, on Broadway before, but you can hear it in the show. <laughs> and, and how it would filter through these guys with their present day sensibility so that the songs aren't just um, pastiche, but they are evocative of period through the lens of their very particular contemporary high IQ, big talent perspective. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the thing that excited us most about uh, adapting this musically was uh, everything Rich just said about it being set during the most, one of the most exciting times in the development of American music, but also it's, uh, it's a story on uh, rails. It, it's literally, a train uh, going across the country, which means we can, uh, without forcing it, uh, write in all of these different American styles from bluegrass to delta blues to uh, trad jazz to all of these different sounds as they're going from, you know, Utica, New York to Chicago to, uh, to the next stop. And that was exciting. And the thing that really put it over the edge was that 
because Rick had decided to make it a memory play uh, from the perspective of this man uh, in, we can't say the present because the timeline doesn't really work out, but you know, the, the, early, the 90s. <laughs> Um, it gave us this huge window of sound to draw on, potentially. And, you know, we are musically, you know, kind of a product of just, like, learning from each other. So the way that we naturally play music together, it doesn't really fall into one particular genre, except broadly the, you know, contemporary folk umbrella. Uh, so we have a sound that we think is pretty unique, and because this is a memory play, we're able to use that sound uh, in moments in the show that sort of elides the time uh, that's passed since 1931 to the moment where this old man is having these, these memories. Uh, so, you know, when we started to do the song spotting, we kind of divided it into categories and you know we talked about diegetic songs which were songs that they might actually hear while they were traveling around the country you know uh, there's one of the first songs we hear is sort of a uh, a working song that you could imagine somebody you know one of these roustabouts picking up a harmonica blowing a few notes and then you know somebody else has a banjo and they're you know pulling the tent together and they're singing this song you know uh, as almost a, a kind of Bluegrass shanty, um, but there's also. That? You want to demonstrate that? Yeah, why don't we? Uh, yeah. Just why don't demonstrate we a few that. bars. Okay. They won't sing the whole thing. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> <about it. laughs> don't sell the show too hard. <laughs> no, I'm not in coming. In Peter's defense, it is it is in the show like a 15 minute musical <laughs> song. <laughs> Try it again. One of the guys, Curtis, who isn't here, he. Uh, <laughs> He used like Woody Guthrie as a reference for this to sort of um, just this was this was never meant to the way we, we usually write shows is that we bring in a song not knowing where it might go just as a tone or as a you know a emotional moment and then we figure out where it ends up by looking through the story and so this is how this started and then if you see the show you'll see that it becomes a much larger piece yeah. but this is the original <laughs> idea. If I had one wish in this godforsaken life, I wish to be back home with my children and my wife. But my debts keep piling up, so my work ain't never done. Ain't it so? Ain't it so? The road don't make you young. saying that's like a song written from the sort in the sort of style and with the sort of mechanisms that we used before we became musical with the capital M composers <laughs> um, but the more we have worked on musicals with a capital M the more we've realized that some of these songs really have to do some storytelling uh, <laughs> as it turns out and you know Rick's sort of uh, uh, mantra that he would repeat to us often as we were working on the show was, you know, I would love it if if the song could swallow this scene. You know, it, I wish I like I'm writing a lot here. If you could just if this could be a song, it would be great. And you know, uh, which is easier said than done when you're working with complicated material like uh, Sarah has given us to to play with. 
Uh, there's a lot of big ideas in the book and in, uh, in the show. And so uh, a few of our early stabs at writing songs that are more, um, more like scenes, uh, you know, we, we had to draw on different styles that lent themselves more to that, um, that kind of pace. Uh, so, uh, for this song that we'll do a little bit of now, um, it's called uh, I Choose the Ride, and uh, it began as, I think, kind of a Randy Newman-esque song in that it, was, it had this kind of languid pace to it, and there was room for, you know, somebody who's sort of gently trying to get a point across. Um, and then there's a response from the other character uh, who... Uh, sings in his own language using uh, themes from the song that we've sort of heard him sing previously in the show. So you hear these two kinds of sounds collide, and one of them is more, um, you know, kind of identifiably Americana sounding, uh, and the other one is a little bit weirder, um, and I'll let you be the judge. Can I, can I ask you a question before you begin? Did you write the scene first and then they got into a song? How did you write, how did you write this song? Because this moment is very important in, in the show. In particular, there's a, there's a thing in, um, that they teach you if you take those courses where, um, that are about like, how do you write a musical? And there's, <laughs> so there's this thing that's supposed to happen um, you know, in the first sort of half hour, let's say, of the show, which is called the I Want Song. And um, you know, we all can think of you know, familiar examples of all, and all I want is a room somewhere far away from the goal, or if I were a rich man, or, um, uh, um, you know, part of your world from, from uh, uh, Little Mermaid that, uh, that uh, Peter did. And um, uh, it's the character that you meet and, and then the wish expressed after you get to know that character a little bit, and so that you're rooting for that character throughout the rest of the story. Our story is a little bit different because um, uh, the, the character that you're rooting for, the, the central character, enters the story in extremis, having just lost everything. And um, uh, he doesn't quite know what he wants because he's in shock. And um, so the, his first, the first expression that he has, musical expression that he has, is the song that Dan mentioned, which is the thing that sounds like somebody who doesn't know what the hell is going to happen, and um, and uh, uh, and then he needs to decide whether he's going to stick around or not. And sticking around or not isn't really I what you what you know. And I want like I want to stick around. It's not particularly strong, but it can't be any stronger than that for the sake of the story because he doesn't know. And it would be false if he said, "By golly, after being here for 15 minutes, I'm going to make the circus my life." It just, it just feels a little bit not great. So we wanted to do something with nuance. And so we talked about maybe this would be a, a want song that he would be um, uh, enticed into by something that uh, that everyone else was doing that he would witness that would make him realize how much he had lost, how much he missed what he'd lost, and how here might be a place where he could find a substitute for what he'd lost, a sense of belonging, a sense of home, those things that are so important to all of us in our lives. Feeling home is not a place, right, necessarily. He's a kid, he doesn't quite know this, he doesn't quite know a lot of things, he's just a kid. So, um, so we talked about something that would sound almost church-like, that he would witness, and he would hear, and in the course of that sound, he the, the lyric would basically be telling him to, that this isn't for you. And um, you know what you do in your life, especially when you're young, when somebody says this isn't for you, that becomes the thing that you want. And so it's this wonderful, you know, it's what's so great about working with these guys, because they, it's not like you would hear in a show, it's not this sort of frontal, I want to be, rich, and if I'm rich, I'm going to be happy. It's not like that. It's, it's, you don't, no, 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 you don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. Yeah, yeah, I do. No, no, you don't. Here you go. And it's not like any other kind of want moment, but it is the want moment in our show. And it sounds something like this. <laughs> <laughs> So 
these are two characters. One of them is Camel, who uh, has been at the circus for years and years and years, and has kind of taken the protagonist, Jacob, under his wing during this first day on the job. If you've got somewhere to go back to, maybe it's hard, maybe it's bleak. Words were said, maybe your daddy smacked you. If you've got somewhere, go back and patch the leak. Cause this place ain't even a place. This place ain't no kind of home. It's just a way to get from nowhere to nowhere else. If you've got somewhere to go back to, you should go. If you'd asked me a week ago, I would have said yes. Some place to go back to, a home that was blessed with light. The future looked bright. How fast it all can change, the blink of an eye. Your future can disappear. People can die, just die, they I don't have somewhere to go back to. My folks, they're gone. The house. The one that I grew up in belongs to the bank now, so I moved on. This place is always in motion. This place is so alive. If it's a choice between nothing. I choose the nowhere on wheels. I choose the ride. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about them and talk about their process for a second, their journey. Um, they're collective. They have directed, they act, they write for themselves that your history has been, they perform their own work, they do all the, everything together as a collective. This is the first time that anybody asked them to write songs for other people, and to write songs for a musical that they're not performing in, and they're not acting in, and they're not directing, and they're not doing anything except being the composers. And I would love to hear from you about that journey, how complicated it's been, emotionally. <laughs> Um, talk about the letting go of your baby. Speaking of letting go of your babies, um, Jessica Stone, who's our director, tremendous and has been leading this charge for the last five years, has sort of brought us all together, done everything to make it all happen. And so, I, again, to, whoever wants to grab it, talk about this is your first time being the composer. Well, as a collective of songwriters, it kind of feels like we're often. A, adapting each other's work. You know, someone will bring in something, a song that feels personal to them or means something to them and say, okay, take it and make it better, hopefully. Um, so we're somewhat used to doing it with each other uh, and it's it's kind of um, nerve wracking and freeing to think about, okay, let's let, uh, let's do that, that process amongst ourselves and then now let's take that and give it to other people to, um, hopefully make better. And we feel pretty strongly that um, we've got people on our side and are, are there to support us and have continually 
just made our things better that we're showing them and presenting. So it, while it feels nerve wracking, it, it doesn't ever feel like it's something that um, we've been unhappy with the process or as stressful as it can be. Um, yeah, you know, I think a great thing about this uh, team, and that includes the people who aren't here today, uh, our director, uh, Jess Stone, as Peter mentioned, but also uh, an enormous uh, room full of, uh, you know, circus performers, uh, our circus choreographer, Shana, our choreographer, Jesse, our uh, designers, our, uh, this enormous group of people who all sort of miraculously have one thing in common, which is uh, they get along <laughs> with other people. Uh, and, you know, for as long as we've been working in theater, you know, we, we don't have as much experience in different rooms as people, uh, you know, at a similar, similar place in their career because we spent so much time together. But we have been in enough dysfunctional rooms <laughs> to know uh, what kind of luck we've stumbled on here. And, you know, that doesn't always show up in the way that you would imagine. It's, it's, it's not that, you know, uh, it's a room full of people shouting at each other. That's not the thing that's really, that's not when things are at their worst. It's when everyone's really quiet and yeah. siloed and sort of unable to broach the sort of discussion, this enormous multidisciplinary multi art form that is theater that requires all of these different elements to work in concert together. And somehow there's so many shows that just end up, well, it's my job to do this. And so here you go. And it's my job to do this. And there you go. And, and this room, you know, from, from the top down, starting with Peter, and Rick and Jess uh, and Sarah's generosity with her story, uh, it's made it very easy uh, and exciting to have conversations about art together uh, instead of, you know, I think it would be to this story's detriment if we weren't able to all uh, engage that way. So um, I think for us that's been, you know, Did you want to say something wish fulfilled. You put no, no, Dan said it all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I think it's, it's, um, it actually feels quite familiar um, because everybody is, you, you know, you see something on stage and it's maybe not your department, but if, you know, it's a, a very generous room um, and it, it's nice to have somebody in a different department feel strongly enough about the music to come over and say something and say, hey, I've been hearing this 40,000 times, you know, what about this? Well, also, we, like Peter mentioned, we been writing for ourselves for a long time. And so it was kind of freeing to say, okay, we can write for someone else. And we have a lot of gifts, but we don't have all of the gifts. And so, you know, like the elephants in the movies, you know, we like Matt's eyes, Ryan's tail, <laughs> uh, can stand on a ball. You know. But, uh, you know, we can't do all the things. So it's, it's sometimes very freeing to say, okay, we have the, the ability to write for voices that are not ours, for musicians that uh, know instruments that we don't know. Um, so it kind of broke open the mold for us as far as being able to say, okay, now we have this whole playground of, uh, of tools that we can use to write new music. Um, so that was kind of an exciting adventure to start. I think the most important thing for me as a producer, and along with my producing partner, Jen Costello, and all the producers, is creating this room. The room is huge. There are 30 seven actors involved. There are 12 musicians. There is a core of um, designers, stage management. It's a huge show. So don't get fooled by these guys playing little bluegrass over here on the right hand side. <laughs> um, it's not that. It's inspired by that. And I think that's the constant struggle. How big, how small musically, how much music, how uh, orchestrated, how Broadway it should sound, because at the same time, that is, uh, there's huge production numbers, right? You want to talk about either, either Lion or Zostan or? Yeah, well, we're not going to be able to perform them for you because <laughs> we can't do flips. Yeah, right. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's definitely songs in the show that we wrote to be, you know, well out of the realm of our own, our own capabilities to perform. Uh, you know, a show about the circus kind of demands virtuosity and all of the different uh, skills that it employs. So when we started talking about uh, one of the major characters in the show, August, 
um, who you know is is a conflation of a few characters in the book, but uh, in our story is you know this uh, flamboyant showman um, who's incredibly charming and dangerous and all of these things. Uh, we modeled a lot of his sort of musical persona after some of the great you know band leaders. Um, Cab Calloway was someone we kept coming back to because he's just the most theatrical uh, performer and has this you know unique kind of relationship with his band and his audience and uh, and his his own gestures. Um, so we wrote the song called "The Line's Got No Teeth," uh, which will make more sense in context uh, but it's it's just a big sort of you know rip roaring um, big dance number big dance number in terms of just broadway dance right but done in a different way yeah right? done uniquely so it is not something you could see before and i think i'm going to talk about the circus artists for a second yeah that part of this team's job was again if you've seen paramore or Cirque du soleil you see terrific tricks and what they have done brilliantly, along with Jess Stone, has integrated, and Shana Carroll and Jesse Robb, have integrated the circus tricks into storytelling. So there's never a moment you're seeing a trick that doesn't help you tell the story. And that is, in some sense, unique. I don't think we've seen it on Broadway before. You've seen the show, you've seen the circus work, but you haven't really seen it tell a story and be integral. You can't pull it out. It just isn't a trick. There are many tricks, but you can't pull it out. I'm going to talk about it a little bit, and then we will. Either, you want you got one more number to do? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the uh, it's it's true. I I uh, I had a sort of a failed um, time on one of these things because I was brought on to like be the story guy on a show that was all circus acts, and I thought. Oh, all right, I'll, I'm gay. Um, so here's the story. And um, and they said, okay, well, here are the acts that we're going to do. And, you know, I said, okay, but, but like, what is this trampoline have it to do with anything that's happening in the story? They said, well, but it's a trampoline act. <laughs> and I said, well, do you have anything like where, you know, you're juggling with knives? No. Uh, well, could there be anything? Is this sort of like, you know, I could kind of imagine that there would be some sort of metaphor for the acts in terms of the arc of the story. And then they said, well, but even if that's true, if the person who's juggling the knives is sick that day, the person who goes on to replace that person isn't a knife juggler, that person is like a tumbler. So I said, so you're saying and on any given night that the audience would come, they would see a story that goes from A to E, Except on t uh, Tuesday, it might there might be a J in there somewhere yeah. right? because of, because that you know because like this ten minutes is supposed to be a circus act, and they said, well, yeah, how else can you do it? Like you have to find all these people who are uniquely skilled to have the same skills, which is the opposite of the uniquely part. <laughs> so I said, yeah, but I quit. <laughs> I believe they've solved that particular problem. This particular musical because the circus artists interchangeable. They're not interchangeable, but if the trick's in the show, it's in the show. Everything that they're doing with the vision of Shana and Jesse, who are the people who are, you know, saying, okay, here's your story, and here's a menu of things that we can suggest to, in support of that story, and then we will find people who can actually do that, and we'll find more than one of them so that, <laughs> you know, so that the curtain can go up on any night and the audience will not be scratching their heads saying, what the hell is this about? And it's also, it's also because the milieu of the story is the circus. So it's not just an overlay. It's not just a metaphor. It is their environment. It's their um, raison d'etre. It's their, it's literally the means of, um, putting food in their mouths and surviving this depression when half the country is unemployed. Um, it's something that they can do. It's something they can do together, together so they have this, a set feeling of community. And it's also um, a meta great metaphor for our storytelling, especially because it's all being told through the recollection of somebody so that even the parts that you can't um, render, you can 
you understand their absence because it's a, a memory and we don't remember every single thing about every single moment of our lives. So it's it it was a it was a it's a it's the great story to be able to have a circus um, company uh, telling it because it's set and this seems so obvious, but you know the other the, the my stupid idea on the other one was had nothing to do with the circus. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> well, they also because the circus performers getting to um, getting to meet them and, and get to know them and experience them in the room. They're not Broadway performers. They're a brand new uh, species of performer that's like meeting the Broadway show, and um, so they bring like a brand new energy to everyone. And because some of their family members are people who existed in circuses that exist like the ones in our show. So there's like a continuation of the lineage of some of the performers in this. So there's like this amazing authenticity to watching them say, this is what it would actually be like. And we can say, we believe you, we trust you, and like, thank you for, uh, yeah. One last song to finish up. Sure, it's not a circus song. <laughs> Uh, while he tunes his guitar, uh, uh, is sort of firmly in the world of a song that we would just write as a band uh, and play in a concert that kind of has this contemporary folk sound, but it meets uh, the perspective of this character in this sort of pivotal moment in the show. So when Ryan wrote this, he did a really good job of taking, you know, kind of the phrasing and the approach to his songwriting that he usually takes and uh, weaving in this very specific uh, character journey. Um, this song is called What Do You Do? Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, Ryan. 
Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. I thank everybody for joining us on the panel. And I think we have time for some questions. We have a few minutes. If there are any questions, we're happy to take any questions. Yes. Everybody here understand the question. The question. The question was, how do you, as a group, take a song off individually, collectively? What is the process when you think, oh, we're going to do this song? What is the process? Um, I think what we start started at least with this show was sort of I, we just sort of all dove in, and um, I remember at the first session we did the pitch session for Sarah. I remember there were two songs, and it was sort of everybody just sort of dogpiling like, oh, I've got something, and I think we landed on three or four songs that the rest of us sort of rallied around and sort of built out the you know, a, a crude version of what, a, you know, the world of the show would be. And then as the years went on, it sort of made sense that if somebody wrote a six, or what we thought was a sort of successful song for a character, that we would sort of lean on that person. To, you know, Ryan sort of, that song that you just heard is sung by Marlena, as Peter said, and it sort of, you just sort of kept gravitating towards those songs for that character and saying, you know, Dan, you sort of wrote all those August songs in that way too, where it sort of, you, you want a character to sort of sound the same, um, not that it was any sort of rule, but I think it would just sort of make sense that it's like, well, that character sort of lives in this sonic world, so let's see where that would go. Yeah. Um, and that sort of unfolded point, for this. Yeah, and at a certain point we did, we had uh, in the first couple of years with Rick, it was like, first off, writing with Rick is like, um, being in a room with Rick is like this for hours. It's like amazing. Like uh, we're so lucky to have been able to like spend as much time as we have with Rick. Yeah. And it's our theater dad, it's, it's, so then at times where we would take in you know songs that um, if Rick liked it, we would be like, okay, that makes sense now. But then also for like a song like this, this came later when we knew that the story needed to start you know like coalescing into a more specific place for each character so we you know we knew that we wanted to hear from Marlena at this moment and she needed to be saying something about this journey so like we we made up a, a lot of songs that made the world and then the world began to be populated with characters and then the characters started to live their stories and that was kind of like the the layering of how we got to where we are now and now we're in the rehearsal process being like does it make sense? And it luckily has made All of it more, <laughs> make, make more sense than we, you know, initially thought it might. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and the question? Yeah. I know you said the mantra was, I want the song to swallow the scene. I don't understand what that means. <laughs> oh, it's, um, it, in, uh... Anybody hear the question? Uh, what does it mean to have a scene, song swallow the scene? Right. Um, Rick? Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I, it's not, uh, you understand, uh, all I am is, a, is somebody who repeats a lot of things. That, uh, <laughs> and one of, the thing, one of the things that I learned uh, at, 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 from having a, a, growing up here in New York and you know, going to the theater all my life and working in, you know, holding lots of jobs in the theater was seeing that the, the musicals that really matter um, all seem to have in common that they began with lots of um, written pages, sometimes as e sometimes even a a almost in the form of a play, and that would it would include dialogue, obviously, but it would also include structure, um, how how you tell the story, in how you approach the story. Um, the style of the piece, and at, at when the songwriter or writers come into the process in terms of writing, they've been there from the beginning, or it ought to be from the, there from the beginning, part of the conversation. But the writing, per se, the actual putting words on paper, whether they're stage directions or character descriptions or dialogue, that's usually the, the job of the quote-unquote 
book writer. Book in term, it's a stupid word because it's not a book. She's the book writer, <laughs> but the you know, but it's it's based on the Italian libretto, you know. But um, if you're the book writer, it's your job to sort of for, take a, approach the blank page and start putting things on it, and then the songwriters come along and say, okay, we're going to take that, we're going to eat it, and a song's going to come out. You know, uh, here's a good example. Um, there's a play called Pygmalion, George Bernard Shaw wrote it, and inside of that play is a speech where the professor, Higgins, um, is missing the woman he's transformed and felt uh, become attached to because she's basically said, you know, I'm out. And he, and Shaw wrote a line of dialogue for him. He says, but I've grown accustomed to her face, he says to himself. And many, many songwriters worked on um, transforming Pygmalion, a play, into a musical. And then eventually along came Lerner and Lowe. And Alan J. Lerner said, you know, I think these other guys have been working too hard because Shaw's <laughs> telling us, he's, he's giving it to us right there. Why don't we just eat that? <laughs> and out came that song that we all know. So that's, uh, that's, it's just sort of a, it's, it's a description, sort of a, a bit cavalier description of what the process is. The songwriters take the scenes that could be 20 pages long or a half a page, or even just a paragraph, and they come back with something that you've just heard. What's especially interesting in terms, again, of, of our show is how different it is, because very unusual, um, very unusual to have an entire scene performed in song, unless it's an opera or an Andrew Lloyd Webber show. And, <laughs> um, and, um, and, uh, and in this particular moment, it, it would be a very, very easy scene to write. Very, very easy scene to write. A woman who, you know, who leaves a marriage and, uh, you know, and, and is figuring out what she's gonna do um, uh, in some flop, floppy, crappy hotel that she just beds down in for the night because she has nowhere else to go. And um, to turn it into a musical internal monologue is the art. The, the craft is, oh, there should be a scene here where this is what she experiences and this is what she needs to express for the audience to push the story forward. The art is that. Thank you. We have time for one last question. Who'd like me last? What? Why the hell did it take you a decade? Part of the problem was these gentlemen here. <laughs> because Rick said, I want to do this in a way that's never been done on TV, or very rarely done, in a collective approach. And therefore, going to write independently, only when we're in the room together, only when you schedule us all together, will we write bits and pieces. Because of the way they work, with their creative process. So over the two and a half years initially, um, we met four times in the year for two weeks each time. Well, we, I mean, we've met a lot. Yes, but, but in terms but of- we, But we were in the- We, we were in the year. Yeah. <laughs> we, didn't tell, we didn't tell you about it. That's kind of, <laughs> there was pizza involved and we just hated to share it with yeah, you. Yeah. 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 We've done three workshops, so that took a while. We've done one out of town tryout in Atlanta in June. We did a rather large thing. Um, part of it is raising money. Part of it is the legal work. Part of it is just the creative work. We had two years of COVID shutdown with the world shut down, which is rather beneficial for us, oddly, because no one was working. And therefore, they were available to do other to work by Zoom, and it was a very lovely process with Jessica, who really led that process of how to refine the script in a way when we're not actually in the room. And a lot of time was spent on new songs, new ideas, really at the behest of Jessica, in terms of this is what it should be saying at this moment, and that was very beneficial. Um, it just takes a while to get a theater. It takes a while just to get everything done. I would say we're probably a little long, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I, I, not the show, just the time frame. <laughs> <laughs> the show is exactly as long as it should be. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. We hope to talk to you today. Thank you again.